Hi, everyone. I am very excited to be once again sitting down with Dr. Sean Smith, my friend and colleague. Sean, thanks for joining us today. Ryan, it's good to see you again, and um, congratulations on all the success of the channel. It's, it's just blowing up, and as it should. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's been kind of a, a banner year for Psychax, and I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. Um, I'm, I'm not cautiously things. optimistic. I'm just plain old optimistic. I think you're going to hit a million. I, I predict by the end of the year. Before then, probably. Well, before then. I hope I can handle the, the success. The, the celebrity. Um, yeah. yeah, something like that. Um, do you get recognized when you go out on the streets? No, I'm a master of, of being the gray man. And, and I, can, I can walk through a crowd and, and it's like I was never there. <laughs> and I, I kind of prefer it that way. There are definitely pros and cons to one's ability to blend in, right? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show today, besides just catching up, is I want people to know that you've written yet another book. Wh which number of book is this now, Sean? You've written at least three, right? I think yeah, this might be six. Whoa. I know I've read three books in my life. And I've, <laughs> I've written six, I think. Yeah. That's quite a feat that you've written. Well, one of them was The Hungry right? Caterpillar, so I don't, know if, I don't know if we count that one. So six books. One of my all-time favorite books in the space is The Tactical Guide to Women. And your newest book is right here. It's called Gatekeeper. And I think we can consider this something of a follow-up to Tactical Guide. Do you think that's fair? Yeah. Although, you know, I, I think about it as the book that I probably should have written first because it's much more about um, that you, the reader, and the relationship patterns that that you're on course to uh, keep enacting, unless you, unless you make a different decision. But yeah, it's it's a follow up to the tactical guide. Was there something that was left unsaid in the tactical guide that necessitated this book? Yeah, there there was the tactical guide, and I you know it's it's nice when you can look back on a book. That book's about five years old now, I think, or six. And it's nice when you can look back at a book and not hate it. Um, because you, you look at, at least for me, if you look at something you've done in the past, I tend to see nothing but the flaws. And I certainly see flaws in the tactical guide, but I also still think it's, it's a good book. It's quality product. And then apparently the market agrees with me. And so I'm, I'm pleased with that book. That book focused a lot more on the character of the women that you're bringing into your world and touched a little bit on, on the relationship dynamics. Gatekeeper is much more about men guarding their own future, looking at their past, d determining where they're headed, unless they, if they stay course or change or change course, and the the type of relationships that they were taught about that they're going to continue. But it's not a lot of psychologist relationship speak. It's very nuts and bolts. Hey, this is here. This is how things work. These are the pitfalls. These are some of the um, the the ways I've seen men approaching relationships throughout my 20 years of, of training and practice. Here's what I've seen work. Here's what I've seen not work so well. And uh, you know, sort of a nuts and bolts guide to making sure that you don't destroy your future with the wrong relationship. And yeah, that's about it. Okay. So it's on some level, not enough simply to avoid toxic women who manifest red flags in the relationship. Like yeah. obviously that's desirable, but that's not sufficient to securing a high quality, secure, long-term relationship? Well, there's an inherent um, problem with red flag lists and everybody has flag, red flag lists and you should have red flag lists. But the problem with them is, is that you can memorize 50 red flags and then you can get blindsided by number 51 that you never even thought of. And so the alternative to that is knowing yourself and, and understanding how you operate in relationships because that makes your radar bulletproof. If you know where your strengths and vulnerabilities are in, in the way you invite people into your life, then you don't need to walk around with a list, you know, a bunch of bullet lists in your head. You can, you can examine the dynamics as they unfold and make good decisions. Do you think it's possible for a man to get that kind of accurate self knowledge about what really works for him in a relationship without being in relationships? Nope. I don't. Mm -hmm. yeah, so no. does that bespeak that there might be some sort of asymmetry between men and women that in order for men to have successful relationships, they kind of need to have experience in the sexual marketplace in a way that maybe women don't? 
That's an interesting question in a way that women don't. I, yeah, I suppose in the sense that men and women are looking for slightly different things in general. And so, yeah, there, there's always that difference. But I'm of the mind that we get good at what we practice. And so if a, if a guy wants to have a relationship, the type of relationship where he's building something with another woman, and I have no agenda. I don't care if guys get married, don't get married. You know, it's your life. You do what you want. I'm not in the business of advising people how they should live their lives. I'm just in the business of if this is what you want, if you want to build something with a woman, a family, an, an empire, whatever it is, that let's look at what works and let's look at what doesn't work. And so in order to be good at and skilled at relationships, it's like being good and skilled at anything else. If you're going to be good at tennis, you got to play tennis. If you're going to be good at relationships, you better know how relationships work. It's, and I don't, you know, there's there's so many guys out there that get into relationships. And this was me at one point in my life where it's like you've you've bought this high-end vehicle, but you have no idea how it works. Why not learn how the thing works before you try to drive it? And that's sort of my stance on relationships. If you're if you want a relationship, then figure out how they work, which means figuring out how you work. Mm-hmm. So That makes that makes a lot of sense to me. Besides the relative lack of experience, what do you think is men's common obstacles towards that kind of accurate self knowledge about what works for them in, in relationships? The things that the, the common obstacles are the, mostly the things that they grew up around. So the relationships that they saw among the adults as they were growing up, the relationships that they experienced with those adults, the relationships that they experienced with other kids. That's really you know. When you're when you're young, the relationship patterns set in, and then you start flying on autopilot. It's like learning how to tie your shoe. You have to put a lot of energy into learning how to tie your shoe first, and then eventually, you're not even thinking about tying your shoe. You're having a conversation while you're tying your shoe, and that's sort of how the relationship patterns unfold as well. You spend a lot of time up front figuring them out, and then you go on autopilot until you decide to turn the autopilot off and, and take things into your own hands. Yeah, I think that fits with my personal and clinical experience, we get these, we say, I could call them love templates or relationship templates from observing the adult relationships closest to us when we're young, typically our parents. And I think the natural tendency is to inappropriately overgeneralize from that limited data set that yeah. this relationship that I observed or experienced is basically how relationships are or should be. And people more or less move out into the sexual marketplace in their young adulthood with that assumption, I think until they experience sufficient friction or failure or rejection or difficulty, and potentially only after years of it not working do they entertain the possibility that their fundamental models about relationships or their assumptions about women might be flawed. Do you think that that's fair? Yeah. And by the time they have that realization, they've been practicing those patterns over and over and over again and solidifying them. So is there a way to realistically um, help young guys get there faster without having to go through this process of pain by which they ultimately disabuse themselves of their models of relationships? I think there is. That's why I wrote both of these books. Um, because, you know, one of the first things I noticed in my practice, and I started off my practice working in particular, I worked a lot with anxiety disorders and I started working with couples too, because that was really fun. But, you know, I started noticing guys making these blunders in their love lives that just destroyed their lives. And mm -hmm. we've all seen, we've all seen it. And it's not fun for women either when a relationship doesn't work out. And so that's why I started looking at this data and, and putting these books together. But I do think that there's a way to avoid the mistakes that other people have made. And primarily it is to look at the mistakes that other people have made, compare them to yourself. And that's a good starting point. You know, at least you don't need to repeat the mistakes that other people have made. You, you can look at the good decisions that they've made. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I'm working on my own book right now, and I talk about in any certain game, it's generally better in the beginning to learn how not to blunder mm -hmm. than it is to make better moves because 50 fantastic moves in a row can be right. undone by a yeah. single blunder. So what yeah, do you I, think might be some of the biggest blunders that tend to blindside men early on in their dating histories? 
Well, there, there's blunders and there's lack of knowledge. And blunders are things like moving in too early, shacking up and getting entangled with somebody who turns out to be kind of a disaster. That would be a blunder. Um, but it might be a blunder because you don't know any better. And so in, in the realm of things that we're not taught, there's what do good relationships look like? And so many people out there have no idea just the, the basic bare, bare bones minimum of what to seek in a woman, which is what the tactical guide was about, and the bare bones minimum of what to seek in a relationship, which is what the, the, what gatekeeper is about. Because you're bringing this entity, you know, this relationship into your life. It's like a job. It's like a house. It's like, it's a major commitment and it has huge implications. And we're just, most of us, I would venture to say almost all of us is particularly men. We're not giving it. We're not given explicit lessons on here's how you choose a woman. Here's how you choose a relationship. We kind of have to look around and try to figure out what works. And so we're left with a lot of wordless impressions about how relationships function. And when you start to put words to what works and then put words to what you're doing and the principles by which you operate, then suddenly you can avoid those blunders and you can avoid the th most of the things that you were never taught because now you're starting to put words to it, starting to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think maybe one of the reasons why a lot of guys never learn this is because the men around them didn't have the knowledge to impart to them because right. they were never taught by their own fathers or uncles or friends. Yeah. I think that 100%. we're in, a, in, in an interesting moment where I think more than ever before, that information is becoming more and more widely available to men. Unfortunately, at the same time, it's also mixed up with a host of all kinds of information of various quality and validity. <laughs> yes. Some of so, it is very low quality. It's actually it's never been easier to access this information in the history of the world, but it might also paradoxically never be more difficult to find it among all the low resolution information that is circulating. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. There's a lot of noise. Mm. Mm. All right. So I think one of the main takeaways that I got from reading the book is that sometimes you can have a woman who is perfectly good, like a, but just not good for you. Mm -hmm. That seems like it would be a very hard thing to walk away from, especially if a guy up until that point has had difficulty even meeting and engaging a decent woman. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things that makes it difficult for men to have standards with respect to women and their relationships in general is a lack of optionality. Would you agree? A lack of optionality or a perceived lack of optionality or I don't know. What's, what's your thoughts on how much of it is perceived and how much of it is real in general? I think it's very rare for young men to have actual optionality. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of young men don't have the things yet that most women are selecting for in terms of a long-term partner. We know that women tend to value emotional maturity, resources, status, prestige, a stable lifestyle. And almost by definition, when you're 22, you don't have those things. Mm -hmm. You might have optionality with respect to sexual access if you have some game, confidence, and physical attractiveness. But most of those women won't consider you as a viable option for a long-term relationship, which might be okay because a lot of 22-year-old guys don't want to settle down yet anyway. Um, but I do think that that's where a lot of guys get trapped in their late 20s, which is when things start to shift with respect to the relative, let's say, power imbalance between men and women in general, is women are starting to kind of, their stars starting to decline, whereas men's stars continuing to rise and potentially the first woman who shows any kind of real interest who seems to be decent and acceptable is the woman that he ends up marrying and committing to in his late 20s or early 30s well yep we've all seen it yeah and and i would add that yes it's normal that men in in their early 20s don't have these things necessarily that women are looking for i would add that that's not new that's as old as humanity 
Okay. So this is not a new problem for men. I, it, as far as I can tell, it's not a new problem. So what do you make out of, let's, let's kind of zoom out a little bit. What do you make of sort of the social moment in which it seems like more and more young men seem more and more hopeless and disenfranchised, especially with respect to dating and relationships? Yeah, that's, that's a really complicated answer. And I, I don't think there's one thing that we can point to. And I think when I, when I venture into social media and so forth, I see people trying to pick the one answer, trying desperately to find, you know, how do we solve this problem? And so they'll point to Tinder, they'll point to feminism, they'll point to, you know, any number of things and say, this is the reason young men are struggling. And I don't think it's a, I think it's all of the above. I think there are many things that men are struggling with right now. I think every generation in humanity has had something that they were struggling against. Not to minimize what guys are struggling with now. Um, it's, it is kind of rough out there. And I know that the online dating apps have really complicated things for young men. How so? What I, you know, I have been off, I've been off the market for. Have you ever used years. online dating apps or did you no, meet your they, wife well before this happened? No, when, no, when I was, well, I've been with my wife for 20, something you know uh -huh. high 20s and we've been married for 25 it's going great but yeah there was no there were no apps back then there might have been the the first beginnings of something like eHarmony but it doesn't matter what i'm hearing from young guys these days is that there is sort of this marketplace and i'm seeing two marketplaces there there's a maybe we can talk about that in a minute but there's this marketplace where there's this online you know these these online dating apps like tinder and so forth bumble hinge where most men are tremendously disadvantaged um, because, as far as I can tell, the things that women look for behaviorally don't really show up on those apps, particularly Tinder. All it shows up on apps is, on most apps is a little description and a picture, as, as I understand it. And so the things that women, you know, I might have been able to use to my advantage when I was younger, and I did use to my advantage things like humor and, and a little bit of swagger and um, just the ability to, to make eye contact and sort of have a little game and a little bit of playfulness. That's very difficult to do on an app. I think it's harder to do, or at least it requires a different set of skills. Yeah. Like, I do think it's still important to show that you have swagger, but you mm -hmm. might have to do that indirectly through your pictures, for example, in a way that maybe you were going to do it with your accessories mm -hmm. when you meet, met on a date in person or, you, or something. Or like your that. personality. You, know, you, know, you can, you go on a, if you went on a date back in my day, back in the you know, early 1800s or whenever it was, you could, um, you know, I could go on a date with a woman and she wasn't just seeing me. She was seeing how I interacted with people. She was seeing how I carried myself. She was seeing how I walked. She was seeing how I dealt with things like some, some little thing not going right. Like all of those things mattered. Those are difficult to convey. And those things might still matter to a woman and she do. might look for them on a date, mm -hmm. but you still had to get that date right. to begin with. Just like the guy on Tinder still has to get access to the real life person. So isn't yes. it kind of the same problem? Sort of, but I, you know, I think back in my day, I wasn't competing with Tinder. Even if I hadn't been on Tinder, if I was working someplace, for example, or I was doing a service job and I was encountering all kinds of women, um, I wouldn't be competing with this silent enemy over here called Tinder, where her, her attention is divided between the real world and Tinder. Now, we know that not every woman's on Tinder. It's a very, actually a very small percentage of the population is on Tinder, but we, we seem to blow that data way out of proportion. But my point being that the competition was just different, and I think it's much more complicated these days. Well, I think even more so than these traditional dating apps, um, maybe you've heard that the biggest dating app in the world right now is Instagram. Mm -hmm. according to many folks, because there are ways of searching for folks and having direct free access to those people by just sliding into their DMs. Mm -hmm. So on some level, because of social media, even more so than traditional dating apps, men are competing against all men everywhere for any given local woman's attention and affections. And that's, that's very difficult. Like it's hard enough to be a big fish in a small pond it's next to impossible to be the biggest fish in the biggest pond. 
Like yeah. very, very few men can do that. And they, of course, get the lion's share of sexual opportunity in today's marketplace. In that marketplace, I think there are two marketplaces, well, at least two marketplaces. I think there's that online marketplace, which is not a singular marketplace because there are the apps, but then there's also meeting people organically through social media, to you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, the way you might meet somebody organically in the real world. So even the online marketplace, it's not just that people are meeting each other with the intention of hooking up or, or you know, with the intention of hooking up or a relationship through an app. They could just be... They could just encounter each other and decide that they like each other. So that's one. But then there's this other marketplace that doesn't seem to get much press today, which is the real world, because there are a lot of people who aren't interested in the dating apps and they're not participating in that. And that seems to be, resemble much more the traditional old pre-dating app marketplace. Yeah, but I think my understanding is that fewer and fewer men are initiating and approaching women in, in real life. Yeah, uh, whether it's at singles bars or you know around the workplace or in their friend groups, so and and women still seem entrenched in their unwillingness to approach men, even men that they are attracted to and interested in forming relationships with. So it seems like the real world marketplace is kind of on ice these days. It kind of is, and you could frame that as a bad thing and. Or, or you could frame it as an advantage if, if I'm out there, if I'm 25 and I know that none of the other guys are approaching anyone in real life or very few are approaching women in real life. Well, and I've got a little bit of an edge, I guess. I would, I would agree with that. I think on some level, it's never been easier to be more confident and masculine in most contexts for the vast majority of men. Because a lot of that is going underground. A lot of that is going online. And so you actually have to make less of an effort than you ever had to in the past in order to beat out more of your intersexual competition in real world marketplaces. I think it's definitely a skill set that's worth learning for most guys. Yeah, and it's a, it's a skill set that generalizes. Once you get over that anxiety, and it's a visceral anxiety that men have about approaching women because that rejection for most guys is, is powerful. And once you get over that, you conquer that anxiety. Conquering anxiety is a skill that generalizes to other areas. So the next job interview is going to be easier. The next public address is going to be easier. You know, everything gets a little bit easier when you conquer some piece of anxiety. Okay, well, let's also talk about why the possibility that relationships are down, not simply because of competition from Instagram or online dating apps, but because it might be easier and cheaper to secure the goods that people would traditionally secure in relationships in other ways. Like, for example, I did a consultation earlier this week with a guy who's, they were, he was having an argument with his wife who apparently told him that it wouldn't matter if they broke up because he could be replaced by Tinder and TaskRabbit. And hmm. I, that was a pretty cutting blow on her part, but there might be some truth to what she said. Yeah, kind of, kind of vicious if, so if it was vicious. recounted correctly. Um, yeah. But I, I talk about this in an episode in the past, which is that it, it's certainly necessary for women to have men around, like men build everything more or less. They make society run. They create the apps that on, they create the phones and that bring all the goods at arm's reach to these women. But it might no longer be necessary for women to have a particular man in their life and potentially vice versa. Men might need a lot of women around to keep the population sustainable and et cetera, but they might not need a single woman, at least not a single woman for the rest of their lives. Um, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I would say, yeah, it's, you can get by on your own these days, but most people don't seem to want to. Most people seem to kind of like being in relationships. Mm -hmm. Is that because they get something from relationships that they might not be able to get in the marketplace otherwise? I think we're, we're social animals and we, we want to be, we, most of us want to be connected in some way to some degree. And, you know, some people want to have families and kids and, 
and they want to have that liveliness around them and they want to know that when they hit 70 and 80 they'll be able to look back on some meaningful connections and, and have some people around them hopefully that care about them mm-hmm. and yeah I, I don't know why i just it, i guess you get into evolutionary psychology and it's mm-hmm. being attached to each other is what what helps our <clears throat> species progress no that makes sense it, i think it might be a tough sell for a lot of folks in their 20s though i mean yeah. i'm 41 now i never thought i would live this long and you were talking about looking back at 70 or 80 mm-hmm. which basically seems like an eternity away when you're in your early 20s yeah it is a tough sell for guys in their 20s but luckily i'm not here to sell that because that, that would be a tough sell i come in when where people are um, starting to build the relationships and they're trying not to destroy their lives yeah okay so uh that's some interesting stuff about dating and relationships from Sean. Um, one of the things I'm going to transition here. Okay. Um, one of the things that we discussed prior to this conversation was for me to reach out to my community to let them know that I would be talking to you. Yeah, we did a ask, group project. Yeah, <laughs> and to ask them if they had any kinds of topics or questions that they would enjoy the two of us discussing, and we got nearly, I think, 200 responses which I went through and I picked out some of the questions that I personally felt would be most interesting to discuss with you in particular, given your experience and skill set. You want to give this a shot and discuss some of these topics from some questions. Okay, great. I really liked this one. Uh, The comment read, would love to know your personal experiences with women that made you feel very cared for and loved. I want to do a good job caring for the men around me. So presumably from a woman, um, she wants to know, how do men feel loved and cared for? I think that's a great question. Food and sex. What's your answer? (laughs) I think those are are both good things. I, I am a little bit more nuanced. I feel cared for when... When a woman shows that she's been listening and paying attention in the sense that if I'm talking about, to use a very prosaic example, if I mentioned that one of my light bulbs have burned out, the next time I see that woman, she's brought me a light bulb to replace mm-hmm. it with. So it's, it demonstrates that she's paying attention and it demonstrates that she wants to make my life better in an instrumental way by helping me both make my lifestyle more comfortable and helping me move in the direction of my overall mission in life and to do that without being asked or told to do it it's just like she's just there to help out and to chip in when it's necessary that makes me feel very loved and cared for Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is one that um, I struggled with more than others because I as I, when I read this question, I started thinking back on on my career and uh, what have men told me about what works and in, in terms of you know, feeling cared for and what doesn't work. And I had a hard time identifying themes. I would say one theme, and this is this is a don't. This is not a do. And don'ts aren't as helpful. Do's are more helpful. But you know, don't ride our asses is one of the things that that I think I've heard is a trend throughout my career meaning you you you're walking down the street you see an attractive woman she catches your eye you don't you don't want to pursue her she just catches your eye because you're a man and then to have to um answer for for just having a, a sort of normal biological reaction to a woman and and then turning your attention back to your own woman that that being an example or you know just sort of nagging and uh, making things difficult and harder than they need to be. I think that that is a trend that I have heard over the last 20 years from men is we do not feel, most men do not feel cared for when a woman is making things harder than they need to be. The flip side of that, I think the the thing that, um, the flip side of that coin is being someone who's pleasant to come home to. And that goes both ways. Like, but if you're a woman and you want to make your man feel cared for, just be pleasant to come home to. Let, let him look forward to walking in the door and getting a hug and a pleasant greeting and a kind word. Um, that goes a tremendously long way. And that's a, that, that'd be my answer, I guess. 
And I, I think that already assumes a more traditional relationship, though. I, I guess in that framework, the woman is at home waiting for the man to return yeah. from work. Metaphorically speaking, maybe you're home and she comes home. And But the point is that when you reunite, that it's a pleasant experience and it's not something that he's dreading because he knows that he's in trouble for some stupid thing or whatever. That He's in trouble for some stupid thing or that he has to serve as a surrogate therapist or counselor. Mm -hmm. to listen to her vent about her day or to provide emotional support for, you know, dealing with another work-related frustration, etc. cetera. I, I think that in general, it's a good idea to bring as little stress and negativity as possible into your primary relationship. And if you have confidants or therapists or close friends, to kind of do that kind of emotional processing there to keep the space between the two of you as clean and pristine as possible. Do you think that that's fair? I'm thinking about that one. I'm thinking about, you know, handling problems together. And I, I think if there's a distinction to be drawn there, it would be that it's impotent complaining and endless complaining versus um, a woman saying, you're my man. I need to bend your ear for a little bit. Maybe I need your guidance at the end of this. Maybe I just need you to listen. But there being some balance between the, the all the bad news and all the good news and that there's more positivity, far more positivity in the relationship than negativity. And that if there's a stream of, of endless problems from work, for example, that there can be some solution to that, that we're not going to spend the rest of our lives just me listening to you complain about work that, yeah, I'll listen to you try to make sense of the problem and try to work it out. But if this is the rest of our lives, you know, you complaining and me sitting here absorbing, no, that's, that's not going to work. And it wouldn't work the other way either. Okay, cool. I think that that was an interesting response to that question. Shall we move on? Yeah. All right. Number two, I got, do you think depression is actually a mental illness? or just a temporary condition that gets way overdiagnosed. In talking with clients, do you notice a big difference in how it affects men versus women? This one got me kind of fired up. You want, you want me to start on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. What you have to say. Well, first of all, let, let's come up with a, an operational definition of depression. So when researchers look at animals and, and they're looking at depression in animals, the way they measure depression in animals is does the animal slow down? So it does, does it do less of the things that that animal normally does? Sniffing, exploring, grooming, eating, humping, whatever, all the, th all the things that it does. When the animal starts to get smaller in its behaviors, we call that depressed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not a bad way to think about depression in humans, that our behavioral repertoire shrinks a little bit. Our world gets smaller. We get smaller. Now, for men in particular, it doesn't always look sad and slow and depressed. With men, it can often look, depression can often look irritated and agitated and, and sort of energetic. But even then, you see a diminishing, a diminishment in functioning at work, in relationships, in the way they take care of themselves. So this idea that um, depression shrinks you down and makes you less than than you could be and that you want to be i think is a fair fair enough definition for the discussion would you would you go with that i think those are the most reliable signs of depression the vegetative signs i think is mm -hmm. what they tend to call them i also think that male depression tends to manifest itself as irritability or restlessness mm -hmm. i think that that's fair which which i'll, I'll just interject here that that makes it hard to recognize because if a guy's acting like kind of a dick it's hard to to recognize that he might actually be suffering but go ahead yeah many angry men are actually very sad men yeah and i think it's often easier for men to access anger and it because on some level it is deceptively it gives them this deceptive sense of, of a more powerful experience i mean anger is like inflating uh I think it's deceptive because when you actually give in to the anger, you're surrendering your own locus of control and whatever has succeeded in making you angry is now like the matador waving the cape and you are potentially the charging bull and that generally doesn't end up very well for the bull at the end of the match. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we agree on those definitions. Okay. So the, the, next, the next point, I guess, would be that I think... 
we have collectively as a society been duped into thinking about depression as a disease that you catch. It's even in the question, um, is it just an illness or a temporary condition? So we, we talk about depression as if it is this thing you catch, like chlamydia. And it's largely through the efforts of, and they're not evil efforts necessarily, but through the efforts of pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies that we think of depression as a disease. But you and I know that depression can be secondary to any number of things. It can be secondary to physical problems like um, a thyroid problem or bad diet or lack of exercise. It can be, it can come from ongoing problems in your life. It can come from something that happened 30 years ago that you don't even think about anymore, but it's thinking about you and it's driving your behavior. So depression can come from all sorts of different situations, which makes it a symptom, not a disease. When you think about it as, as a symptom, like a fever, a fever can be caused by a thousand different things, but a fever isn't a disease. A fever is just a symptom. And so if you frame it as a symptom rather than a disease, then you get a couple of options. And the first one is, is difficult. That is that you know this is a symptom of something going on, so you get to do the hard work of diagnosing it and then coming up with the treatment plan and then following through on that treatment plan. And that's a lot of work. And one of the things that really sucks about being depressed is that it sucks your energy. So you don't want to do these things that you, you sh that you could do under this first plan. The second plan is you take a pill. And in my 20 years of doing this work, it seems to me that family physicians in particular, wonderful people in general, but they hand out SSRIs like they're candy. And they don't talk about the trade-offs. Now, I'm not opposed to SSRIs. They're just a tool. But every tool has its trade-off. And, and you know, every time I talk about the trade-offs of SSRIs, somebody gets deeply personally offended. So if you found SSRIs useful, good. You know, go with that. But physicians will hand this stuff out, and they don't talk about the fact that there is no free lunch when it comes to neurochemistry. Every time you tinker with your brain chemistry, your brain adjusts. And so with SSRIs, the way your brain adjusts is by downregulating the synapses that are affected by the SSRI. And so you get a window. And in my experience, it's six months, 12 months, something like that, where the fever is reduced, got a little more energy, and the problem will either resolve or you get the energy to resolve it. You figure out what's going on. You know, SSRIs can be lifesavers in that sense that they take the edge off enough that they can get you moving. Or if that doesn't happen, then you're left as that window closes with doing what so many people do, which is switching to another medication. Or you stay on the medication just to avoid the withdrawal of going off of the medication. And so some people have been on medications for years it's not really doing anything because their their brain long ago went back to, back to baseline, but they're just avoiding that withdrawal. And so I'm just going to, I'll close this out by saying depression is a symptom. You'll get a lot further thinking about it as a symptom than you will as a disease. Yeah, I think that was all well said. Anybody who really wants to get into this issue in depth, I would recommend Whitaker's Anatomy of an Epidemic which was written maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and it's a muckraking expose of uh, the pharmaceutical industry's influence in the evolution of our conceptualization of mental illness. Mm -hmm. About 100 years ago, depression was seen as more or less a temporary condition. One of the nasty secrets is that most of the illnesses that are populated in the DSM including depression, tend to spontaneously remit mm -hmm. even in the absence of therapeutic treatment or pharmaceutical intervention, which basically means, I think with depression, that the vast majority of depressions go away by themselves in six to 10 months. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be a very challenging, dark, difficult six to 10 months. And so potentially the SSRIs or other medications can elevate a person's mood and give them the energy and clarity to take constructive action during that window of time that you just discussed. But you're absolutely correct, is that changing your brain chemistry over time creates sometimes irreversible changes in your neuroanatomy and your neurophysiology. 
and that once the medication is discontinued, a syndrome that in many respects can mimic the initial problem reappears. Mm -hmm. And too often, according to Whitaker, this rebound depression gets misdiagnosed as the original depression returning as opposed to, let's say, a withdrawal syndrome from the psychiatric medication. Yeah. And of course, in, in, many, in many cases, the individual then goes back on either that SSRI or uh, an equivalent medication, and this, the problem is just sort of worsened over time. Now, I do agree that depression is largely a symptom and it can be a symptom of many different things the thing that i think depression is a symptom of in the vast majority of cases in men is it's a symptom of being low status and i don't think you mentioned that it's like it's possible for a man to be confident and contented and happy and clear when he has no sexual optionality when he has no money or a secure livelihood or a comfortable lifestyle. It's possible, but it's extremely difficult to be happy and contented and confident under those conditions. And I think that is the natural state of things when most young men enter into the world. Is there the lowest person on every totem pole? Women typically don't want them because they don't yet have the things that women filter for in their selection process. And most men don't really want them because they don't have skills. They don't have experience. Mm -hmm. They're kind of a liability. They can only be helped. They can't really help the team in their mission. So it's very, very difficult for a lot of young men and they don't yet have a place in the world. And I think that their depression is often a manifestation of that low status. And the, the issue there is that can become like a trap. Like the, if the low status creates a depression and depression is associated with, let's say, hopelessness and despair, that young man may then inappropriately overgeneralize and say, it's always going to be this way. Mm -hmm. There's no way out. Um, it's all fucked anyway. You can't do anything about this. But that could very well be the depression talking. And we see this in, you know, non-human primate studies that as male primates elevate in their stat respective status hierarchies, a lot of those vegetative symptoms of depression tend to disappear. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think you, I'm, I'm with you 100% on how difficult it is to be a young man. And I think women have no way of comprehending how difficult it is to be a young man. And it's only a handful of men who seem to remember how difficult it was being a young man. But so much of the behavior that you see from young guys where they're, they're being reckless and they're, they're abusing substances and they're, they're out causing trouble. Some of that is just because their, their knuckleheads and their brains haven't grown in yet. But some of it is because of this situation they're in where the world is demanding that they start providing. The world probably demanded a long time ago. You start, you start giving more than you take, mister, but he doesn't have the skills to do it. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the juice. He doesn't have the influence. And he's, he's just sort of stuck and he's floundering for a few years. And that's where the places like the military are, are really good for a young guy because they say, all right, you got a, you got a purpose starting today. And that jump starts that sense of having a purpose in life. I can see that. Not just a purpose, but you also have a, a set, a cadre of comrades mm -hmm. as well so you, you got have a team you got a hierarchy you got a place in the hierarchy even if it's at the bottom if you know where you are and you know what your job is that's good enough for 99 percent of young guys it can be difficult but also i think in those hierarchies where you are very clear about where you stand there's also also there's also generally a pathway mm -hmm. that everyone understands to to move up that hierarchy as well yeah. Like most folks know what it takes to go from an E6 to an E5 when they're in those sort of military hierarchies. Yeah. If you go on Twitter, Twitter um, or Facebook or Instagram, those places, places like that, you will see a lot of men telling other men, you don't need therapy, you need to go to the gym. And I think this is the problem that they're trying to solve. They're trying to talk to young guys and say, you've got to get moving. 
because guys get immobilized in this state. And if you can get yourself to the gym and at least start seeing some progress there, then you're starting to develop a skill set of establishing progress. And, and I'm convinced that when I hear guys say, you don't need therapy, you need the gym. Well, okay. Sometimes you, you need more than one option in life. Some, you know, therapy is good for some problems. The gym is good for other problems, but I'm, I'm convinced that it's guys trying to help other guys just get out of this morass that we get stuck in, in our early, early twenties. Yeah, I think it's much harder. It's not impossible, but it's much harder to get depressed when you're successful, when you have built mm -hmm. a life worth living, when you have found your purpose and you're enabled and incentivized every day to move in the direction of that purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that it, it may even be difficult for young men who are mired in depression to work towards that for another reason, which is that it can be comforting to remain admired in the inertia. One of the things that I remember experiencing when I was younger is I was really cautious about investing in myself and building a life worth living because I knew I was afraid of having it be taken away, which felt like it would be even more painful and difficult than if I never had it to begin with. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, don't try. You can't get hurt. Yeah, that wasn't true. Like once I finally made the decision to go for it and invest in a career and to take self accountability and to improve my lifestyle, my life only improved. And even though I know on some level that everything I've been given will be taken away from me one day, I don't in any way whatsoever feel like that is a liability with respect to the life I would otherwise have been living. Mm -hmm. It's hard to and see yeah. that though, when you're stuck in, in those early twenties, late teens, it, you, know, you don't have any context to, to put that in. You know, it's easy, relatively easy for us to look back and, you know, I have a similar story where I, I was stuck for a while and had stuck for my own reasons. And now I can look back and see, well, I shouldn't have been stuck. You know, I should have had a much bigger mindset than I did. Well, that's interesting. So what personally got you unstuck? Do you remember? Not, not a single thing. Certainly part of it was being on a team. Um, one of my first jobs, I was, I was a mechanic at this place. I was a mechanic trainee. I was nothing. I was just learning how to turn wrenches. And, but I was a part of a team. There were like 10 guys managing these machines and just being part of that team. I got some hard lessons about what it is to be on a team. Some, some hard lessons about what it is to be in the hierarchy and made, develop some great relationships with these guys. And I think that placing myself in that situation where I was accountable to other men, that was a huge experience for me. Hmm. I think for me, it was observing some of my close friends' relative success. In my friend group, I was probably one of the latest bloomers, mm -hmm. and I was still living a bourgeois hedonistic lifestyle in my late 20s when I was working as an actor in New York City. But by that time, a lot of my friends had either finished law school or medical school. They had secure, well-paying jobs. They weren't living in the subsidized housing that I was in Brooklyn. They, were, they had nice apartments where they were buying houses. They had stable relationships that had a high future potential for family and stability. Like They, they had a lot of good things in life and hanging out with these folks became increasingly awkward. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it's like these guys invited me out to for some drinks because they were making money. They wanted to go to the place with like the $15 cocktails, which was way outside of my um, budget. And mm -hmm. I felt increasingly awkward because I didn't want to be the guy who dictated where we went because of my limited means. And I certainly didn't want my friends to be buying me drinks out of pity, for instance. So or I would go over to their houses and my friends never, you know, rubbed it in their face when, when they were improving their lives or becoming more and more successful. But I felt this widening gap um, between me and them, which I was like, I, I didn't want to admit that I, I was feeling envious of some of the things that they were able to achieve. 
And I, I hated that I felt that way because my friends, I, I like my friends. I wanted to be 100% completely happy for their success. But there was this, there was this unintentional emotional response that like prevented me from being wholly positive and supportive, um, at least emotionally, internally. Um, but fortunately, I think that that envy motivated me to examine myself and say, hey, wait a minute, I've known these guys for years and years and years. They're no better than me. It's like, these, these guys aren't special. I, I grew up with these guys. If they can do it, I can do it. Like there's absolutely no reason that I, I can't have the same good things that my friends have been able to secure for themselves. And it was actually their modeling that encouraged me to kind of dream bigger for myself or to grow up. I, I wonder if there's a commonality in the two things that we're describing here. And that is that if you're a young guy caught in this, this normal depression that you go through in your early twenties, that you're probably not going to fix it in your basement. You're going to have to go out and be amongst other people and develop relationships. And something about those relationships is going to pull you in a direction that's, that's probably going to get you unstuck. I think that's really wise because I think it reveals what I would call the intrapsychic fallacy of depression, which is that depression is just something that exists between your two ears. Right. It's, it's like no. an attitude or a set of th thoughts or feelings that can be fixed simply within yourself, which wouldn't require you to leave your basement. Right. If it were entirely based inside of your own um, mind. No, it's, when it's very much that, about your relationship to the world. Yes, your relationship to the world and your place within it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where depression is most reliably and effectively addressed. And I think that you would agree. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think that's a really important topic and I'm glad that we discussed it. Anything more you want to say on that one? Nope. Okay. This one I'm excited to ask you. The question is, if you and Sean had young daughters... Well, I don't have any children, but I do know that Sean has a young daughter, a teenage daughter. So I'm going to have him speak to this. If Sean had young daughter, which he does, at what age would you suggest they prioritize marriage? Or to ask a more general question, what kind of advice are you actually giving your teenage daughter about yeah. men and relationships? When I first read this question, I said, if you and Sean had young daughters, and I thought, you know, I consider Ryan a, a good friend, but not my type. Um, so we're probably not going to have kids. But and I hope that doesn't break your heart. Um, but um, no. <laughs> <laughs> here's what I have told my daughter. She's, she'll be graduating high school one of these days. She's a great kid. And we've talked about trade offs in life. And I think one of the cruelest lies of feminism, it's heartless, it's just a vicious lie, is that we're telling girls that they can have it all, that they can do it all, that there are no trade-offs. And I think what that translates into the minds of a lot of women is you can party in your 20s and you can have adventures and you can build a career in your 30s. And then at some point you can start to have family. And this is such a nasty lie because I think this is new. We were talking earlier about things that might not be new. I think this is relatively new that we're seeing a lot of women hit their late 30s and panic because now they're realizing that, oh, they, they'd like to have a family. They'd like to have kids around. They'd like the, the, the pitter patter of little feet and the fighting over toys and going to a high school graduation someday and having grandkids someday. Like this just hits like a ton of bricks for some women, not all women. And so I've been watching this seemingly increase over the last few decades. And I've been very careful about talking to my daughter and, and telling her that, look, whatever you decide to do with your life, I'm going to back your play because I know you're a good kid. You're going to make good decisions. I'm in your corner 100%. But there are trade-offs and nobody's telling you this. No, you know, well, we send our kid to a good school, but if you go to a public school, you're not getting this message. You're getting the message. If you're a girl, you can have it all. You get it from school. You get it from movies. You get it from songs. You get it from your classmates. You just, it's just this barrage of information that there are no trade-offs. And I think men are better, young men are better at understanding that there are trade-offs in life, if only because nobody has fed us this line of bullshit that we can have everything. Um, so what I've told my daughter is 
be mindful of the decisions that you make early in life because they're going to compound. If you want to have a career, cool, you're going to have a career, but that's going to come at some kind of expense down the road. You can, you're, you're going to have to make trade-offs in life. And if you, for example, want to become a surgeon, you're trading off the first 15 years of your adult life for this career. And at some point you may realize that it's time to get started on a family, but it might be too late by then. So just be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because this is coming right when I'm working on a chapter of the book that discusses optimal dating strategies for both men and women. And I've been struggling with the effectiveness of some of this advice coming from me as a man. Like, this all makes sense to me. I think it would be worthwhile for more women to hear it. Do you think that the fact that we're men would compromise the ability of some of these young women to hear the message? I don't know. I mean, facts are facts and you can, you can listen to or not. And not that I, what I just said is facts necessarily. It's my impression that there is an increasing number of women hitting their thirties and, and getting hit with a ton of bricks. That's my impression. Maybe there's some data out there. You can ignore me or not. Well, everything is, a, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. That sounds. You sound sense. like Thomas Sowell. Who's Thomas Sowell? He's the guy that says there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. He's a, oh, he's a well, brilliant I guess I economist. I sound like Thomas Sowell. Yeah. He's, he's okay. a brilliant man. He's one of the best thinkers in, in, in the last hundred years. I'm, so I'm gonna, congratulations. Thanks for telling me. I, I was unintentionally going to plagiarize this guy. So I guess yeah. I have to go back and uh, credit this. No, but you didn't, you didn't plagiarize. You came up with it on your own. So you were at least as brilliant as he is. Ah, uh, yes. Leibniz and Newton inventing the calculus. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> okay. So women can do everything but they can't have everything is that fair to say i don't i wouldn't even say you can do anything my daughter's not going to be she's not going to play on the nba oh well maybe these days she could I mean, she could you know she could transition and have and throw a hissy fit and play for the nba but there are certain things you know not everything is within reach and this is another thing that i think men seem to understand a little bit better because we didn't grow up with a bunch of movies disney movies telling us that everything is within our reach because everything is not within our reach mm -hmm. how can a young woman realistically and objectively assess what is within her reach? That's a good question. I think you, the same way, but well, I think you go out and you try things. And you, you pick a path that, that feels like it's consistent with your values and you, you start trying things. That's what guys have to do. In this chapter that I'm writing, I talk about a little bit the influence of that, let's say, feminist ideology on women's dating choices that they can do everything and that there are no trade-offs. But I also talk about one of the reasons why a lot of modern women are behind the eight ball with respect to their mating and dating options these days is the relative absence of fathers in their, um, in let's say their, their courtship. Mm -hmm. You nodded when I said that. Um, what do you think about that? Absence of fathers, yeah, it's it's the just relative a plague absence. on society, and maybe it always has been. You know, this is certainly not the first generation to have a shortage of fathers, but yeah, it, it has such a tremendous effect on young women and young men, maybe in, in slightly different ways. I see it in a few different ways. One is that I think a few generations ago, every young man who was courting a young woman would expect to have a conversation about what are your intentions with my daughter at some point, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I, I think that a lot of women are only learning the value of that gatekeeping a bit later in life when they're in their 30s and on their apps and they say, what are you looking for on this app? And it's, um, it's almost like once they realize that their window is closing and they're running out of time to potentially secure a partner for a family, it's almost like they get stricter with respect to their filtering and their mm -hmm. gatekeeping, which may actually be counter productive at that point but like yeah it, it on might some be. level women might need to act as their own fathers because for better or for worse 
their fathers aren't really involved in their courtship decisions anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it might get to jump back at your, your point you just made. It might be more difficult later in life just because the family minded men have all been snapped up and they have families. And so if you're raising your standards while the supply is going down, you're sort of spiraling into this you know, lonely abyss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still uh, suggesting that women lower their standards uh, to secure a relationship is a pretty tough. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a grim option too. Mm -hmm. So I guess getting back to this question, you know, when do you start talking to your, your daughter about prioritizing marriage? I think you have the conversations early and, you know, I, I don't, I don't tell my daughter how to, how to live her life. I guess certainly guide her, you know, show her how to rotate the tires on the car. And when we have lots of conversations about how relationships are unfolding around us, as far as the decision she's going to make that that's up to her. And I'm smart enough to know at this age that I, if I tell her to do something, she's still going to do what she wants and, and she should do what she wants. But you can't have those, those conversations too early about trade-offs and about how relationships work and, and, even though you can't wrap your head around it at your age, at some day, at some point, you're going to be 40 and it's going to come very quickly. And the decisions that you make now are going to compound and, and they're going to affect you pretty profoundly when you're 40. Mm -hmm. Okay, well said. Let's talk about the next question. Why women terminate relationships more often? I love this question. Um, I, I, you want to jump in on that? Well, we know for a fact that women terminate marriages more often than men. They terminate about 70 to 80% of them these days. I think that women terminate fewer non-marriage relationships, but they still terminate more of them relative to men. I think it really comes down to two things, is that most women have more optionality than most men do. And so... When a woman is dissatisfied with a relationship for whatever reason, I think that she has a potentially objectively correct assessment that it won't be as difficult for her to find herself in another relationship before too long. Um, maybe she even has some male orbiters that she can warm up. Uh, most women have not just a plan B or a plan C, but a DEFG. Um, or at the very least, they can put on some heels and a tight dress and go sit down by themselves at a, at a bar on a Saturday night and get some interest from the local male population. So I think it's, it's generally easier for a woman to replace a man because they have more passive optionality than most men do. I would say for younger women, yeah. Older women gets more complicated. I would agree. Uh, with respect to why women initiate more divorces than men i think it's because they're often they often have perverse incentives to do so given the fact that they can still potentially secure the same lifestyle and a sizable income without having to deal with a particular man's demands or obligations Okay. So that's, those are my two cents. What do you okay. think? I'll, I'll disagree with part of that and agree with part of it. And then it'll be interesting to people see people slug it out in the comments. But um, I agree with the optionality for younger women. And particularly, I, I don't know statistics on dating relationships breaking up, who wins what and when. You kind of expect dating relationships, you expect most of them to not work out. You expect, you would expect 99 out of 100 maybe to not work out you know, when you're looking for that, that one person who's going to make a good partner. Not to say that there's a one, but you're looking for, for the good candidate. You got to go through a lot of people. So you kind of expect that. And, and yeah, as far as what you said about women having more optionality, particularly in the teens and twenties, maybe early thirties, absolutely. It starts to change pretty dramatically after that. It's a lot harder for women. Um, where where I would differ with you is in ending marriages. Um, we know that women file for divorce more frequently than men, and I agree with you that there are perverse incentives. I think that if a guy a guy wants to avoid family court because 
he knows that he's, he's if somebody's going to be treated poorly, it's probably going to be him. Although I have seen women get the short shrift and, and I've seen women get mis- mistreated in family court. The reason being that family court is a shit show. It's unaccountable judges. It's capriciousness. There's no juries. There's no oversight. It's just, it's just a free for all. It's a disaster. But a man can go in relatively confident that if somebody's going to be mistreated, it's probably going to be him in terms of custody and that sort of thing. There have been great improvements recently, like in Florida with alimony laws, but um, a, a woman can go into family court with some confidence that if somebody's going to be mistreated, it's probably not going to be her. So I agree with the perverse incentives. As far as why women file for divorce more frequently, it's not fun for women to get divorced. Women don't get divorce for sport. And I know that you're not saying that. Some of the red pill guys out there seem to think that women divorce for sport. They're, they're all just sociopaths and they're, they're like sharks going through the water looking for the next meal. And I, again, I know you're not saying that, but women don't divorce for sport. We know why why people get divorced and we have epidemiological data going back decades and it's pretty prosaic stuff. It's conflict, it's um, cheating, it's substance abuse, it's physical abuse. It's just, you know, the inability to get along together. There, there are very basic reasons for why people get divorced. So the fact that women file for divorce doesn't necessarily mean that women are causing the divorce. And I think this is where people like the red pill crowd crowd really get tripped up. They see that women are filing for divorce. I don't know if it's 70%, but it's more than men. And they say, oh, well, then women must be causing the divorce. And they must be causing the divorce for my favorite reason, which is hypergamy. That's that's the red pill guys. But we also know that men are more prone to the types of behaviors that cause divorce, like cheating and substance abuse. That's just, I mean, it's just kind of how it is. So you can't draw a straight line between women filing for divorce and women causing divorce. It may actually be men a lot of times who are causing the divorce and the woman saying, I've had enough. I've, I've, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I'm done. Okay. I think that some of the epidemiological data will need on this subject will need to be interpreted cautiously because before no contest divorce, if you wanted to leave, it had to be for a significant reason. It had to be because of infidelity or physical abuse, which certainly happened in the context of marriages in the past. Um, but if that's your way out, then and you have to nominate something in order to dissolve the relationship, then maybe there are more false positives there if there were no other way to dissolve a marriage for mm-hmm. instance i think that that's reasonable i don't know to what extent there would be false positives but i i think that we would expect that at least some of them would be um you know i've dealt with a lot of guys in my clinical practice moving through divorce sean and i mean i only hear one side of the story so that's something to consider um but i don't know of a single man I've worked with who have gone through divorce who's told me, yeah, I beat my wife, so I get it. Or, yeah, I couldn't stop drinking, and so I understand why she left. What are the, or, what, if you had to draw some trends, what are the trends that you hear from guys about the reasons for, the, for divorce? Um, it's, it's something along the lines of she's not happy. And she's, yeah. she doesn't, she hasn't felt happy for quite some time. That's actually another factor that is, that's important to put out there is that women are more prone to, they're, they're higher in trait and eroticism than men, generally speaking. And so they are more prone to being unhappy. So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's, it's, it's that. So, um, it's not so much that there are, uh, there's abuse or infidelity or significant structural problems to the relationship. It's that um, they're not in love. We're kind of, we're kind of bickering, so conflict, sure. But it's just this vague sense of like, is this going to be the rest of my life? And I think that's where those perverse incentives differentially affect men and women. I would agree with that, yeah. And so that, you know, I, I would agree with you that the vast majority of women don't divorce for sport. I think that there probably are some sociopathic women out there. Absolutely. Who, I mean, get married because... As far as I can tell, that's the only way that you can get divorced. And divorce can be a a a very lucrative profession um, if you do it right as a woman. Yeah. But I think my sense here is that if if 
both parties are kind of vaguely dissatisfied or unhappy with the relationship, but ending the relationship is more likely to be financially beneficial to one party versus the other. We would expect that under just banal conditions of vague dissatisfaction, the one who is likely to benefit is going to be more likely to initiate a termination of the relationship, all things being equal. And I think that's what we see. Yeah, I think that's a factor. And I think it also comes down to whether we're talking about, you know, that big chunk in the middle of the bell curve with just sort of boring run in the mill divorces versus the extremes where you do have people who are acting very badly on both sides. And some of those people are women and some of those women are just opportunistic sociopaths, but they're the extremes. They're, They're not the, they're not the middle of the bell curve, which is what I think a lot of guys, um, comfort themselves by believing you know that the extremes represent the middle so where does this create any kind of confidence for men because yes uh, men can control their behavior they can say okay i I, i've never i'm not going to hit my wife i'm not going to abuse substances i'm not going to cheat on her and yet that gives him no real protection against divorce which is basically an you know marriage is now an at-will relationship and the man could potentially be halved with respect to his wealth and status as a consequence of a woman's being vaguely dissatisfied could be so, yeah yeah so that's the reason i wrote that's the reason i wrote gatekeeper it's also the reason i wrote the tactical guide to women but you know the the way to avoid the way to minimize risk and i think I, i'm i carefully point this out in the tactical guide that you can't eliminate risk you can only you can only minimize it you can manage it as best you can and one of the ways to manage risk in relationships is to really understand your relationship patterns so that you know what you're vulnerable to. And, you know, it it takes a lot of work. It's, it's a lot easier to just memorize a list of red flags, but the red flags list will only get you so far. And and if you're willing, if you want to have that sort of relationship, which I don't care if a guy has that kind of relationship or not, but if you're going to, you're well served by learning how they work. Does that mean that you might, <clears throat> excuse me, encourage men to delay even considering entering into marriage until a certain time of life, maybe in their thirties? Um, I hear that advice, and I don't. I, I think that's fitting for some for some guys. I don't think it's necessarily good blanket advice, and I think it depends a lot on community and culture. For one thing, if you come. If you come from a community where you're dating within that community, say it's a religious community and you're both on the same page, you're both, you both embrace the religion in in this example. You both know where you're headed. You, you have a purpose and uh, that you collectively, you two are pursuing. Then I don't know that you need to wait until you're in your thirties. I think what you wait for is making sure that you have a good, long, reliable baseline on her behavior on what the how the relationship functions and how well you do in the relationship and that takes a lot of time um, a couple of years man but the, the guideline that I give in the tactical guide is if you really want to get to know somebody you wait until at least a year after the infatuation phase because during that infatuation phase you're not seeing clearly and she's not seeing clearly nobody's seeing clearly you're you're both drunk but if you give it you know, a year just as a good round number after you're no longer infatuated and you've got lots of life experiences with this person, then that's, that's starting to establish a baseline. Fair enough. Let's move on to this next question. I like this one. It says, why is it so hard for men to have a strong moral code and enforce it? What do you think about that? That one I struggled with and I I thought I'd ask you um, if you have thoughts on that one. I do. I think that it's, it is difficult for men to have strong moral codes and to enforce them. It makes me, this question made me think of the classic film, 12 Angry Men. Did you see that one, Sean? I did not. So that is a courtroom drama and it takes place in the jury deliberation room. That's the 12 Angry Men. And 
the protagonist is Henry Fonda. And they're all deliberating on a murder trial. And in their initial vote, Fonda is the only guy who believes that the accused is not guilty. So in the initial vote, it's 11 to 1. And the story is basically him, you know, holding firm on his conviction and in the face of this strong opposition from these other men and eventually moves them in the direction of acquittal. And this is an old movie. It's an old story. I think he made it in the the 40s. And I think it's a testament to like holding firm to what you believe in, even in the face of opposition. Mm -hmm. And what I want to point out is that in this story, which is held out as sort of an archetypal of individual self-confidence in the face of opposition, Henry Fonda only had to face off with 11 guys. Mm -hmm. Versus the world. That was an accomplishment that we made a movie about it and a story about it and we still tell that story today versus how hard is it to stand against millions of people which is more or less what a lot of folks have to do given the internet and social media and things like that like the the willingness to publicly say this is what i believe in these are my convictions and to withstand the opposition that may come down upon you if it's a tough sell, if it's rare for one person to do that against 11, I mean, yeah. how much rarer must it be in today's day and age? That's, that's what that question made me think about. Well, sure. And especially if, if your livelihood depends on it, for example. Sure. Um, you know, you say the wrong thing, you could lose your job. Yeah. And so there's all the external forces and then there's the internal forces. I, I faced this minor um, ethical quandary in my practice this week. There was, there was something that I really wanted to do. It was, a, it was a positive experience. I really wanted to do this. But ethically, I knew it was not something that I, sh- I should participate in. And, um, you, know, you know, nothing um, nefarious or anything, just just sort of a joyous occasion that, that I was invited to go to. And um, I, I flashed back on an ethics professor. I can't even remember the, the person's name, but he started off one of the ethics classes I took by saying, there's probably never going, you're probably never going to face an ethical dilemma. You're just going to face a, a situation with an answer that you don't want to hear. You know what's right. You just don't want to do it. And I had to remind myself of that this week because it would have been so easy to slide on on this little ethical um yeah, just, just this little ethical thing probably would have had no consequence. I could have very easily justified it. But when you start letting yourself slide on the little questions, then it gets easier and easier to start sliding on the big questions. One of the ways I conceptualize having values is that values have value and therefore they are expensive. Mm-hmm. And sometimes to uphold your values it can be very costly. It can cost you a relationship. It can cost you a friendship. It can cost you your livelihood. It could uh, cost you your peace of mind or even your security, like your physical security. Mm-hmm. Um, and the unwillingness or the inability to pay those costs suggests that that value is only held more or less in name only. I think a lot of people, especially in today's day and age with our penchant for virtue signaling, people might think it's enough simply to espouse the right beliefs, to to say the right things, and they might be unprepared for paying those costs when the rubber hits the road. Um, In terms of the the blowback that they're going to get. Or the blowback from specific people antagonism in their relationships, maybe friends turning their backs, losing job opportunities. Like the stakes have never been higher and never before, maybe not never before, but like in today's day and age, it's not enough to simply like just do your job well. You know, now that's the ability to do your job is mixed up on, mixed up with, you know, do you have the right beliefs? Mm -hmm. I might not be able to it was, it's not enough to just be a, a good actor or a good baker or a good carpenter. It's like we've dredged up some information about your conduct in your personal life and, and now you've been canceled or you've been 
barred from effective action in the marketplace. That's, that's very difficult to stand up against, I would think. It is, and it takes a, a special combination of fortitude and intellect and um, drive I think to, to overcome that. And I think you're a good example of somebody who has stepped outside of that system because you have this channel where you say things that people in our profession are not supposed to say. And I, I won't say you become uncancelable, but you're not subject to HR. You know, you're not subject to the mob, uh, you know, ruining your life in the way that they might ruin the life of somebody who has a job where they could get in trouble with HR. And, I mean, let's but, hope not. I'm not trying to court any kind of controversy yeah, here. Yeah, and, and we're all subject to the mob, I guess, you know, but, but you have stepped outside of the system and I, not everybody can do that. Not everybody is in a position to do that. Um, but I, I don't, actually, now that I say that, I don't know how true that is. What do you think? I think, I think people can step out, but it's not like what I've been able to build for myself I could construct overnight. Like I've been oh, an entrepreneur no. yeah. for 20 years. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why I went down that road is because I have put myself in position where other people were empowered to either give me things or take them away mm. at their own pleasure. And I didn't like that. Yes. Um, so I went through the trouble and the expense and the toil of building something that I had more direct control over and could protect from the capriciousness of others and other I, I don't think i'm unique in doing that in any way but it it does take a certain temperament to be able to do that you have to be able to assume a great deal of risk um you have to be willing to be completely self-accountable um, and you also have to be able to compete successfully in the marketplace I mean, one of the benefits of being an employee is you don't really have to think about anything. You mm -hmm. just get hired. You show up. There's, a, there's an office to go to. There's a desk there. Like someone actually furnished you with supplies. You didn't have to scrounge up a, a customer. The business already did that. They just email you to say, hey, take care of X, Y, and Z. You work for a predetermined amount of time and then you get to go home and not ever think about your job again. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot of pros to simply being an employee. Everything just sort of gets taken care of for you. Um, that's certainly not true when you're an entrepreneur and you run your own businesses. Can everybody be an entrepreneur? Probably not. Probably not. No, I, I don't know how well society would function if everybody was an entrepreneur. Um, certainly, uh, society would look very different. But what I'm suggesting is that most people a lot of people don't have the, the temperament or the skill set to be a successful entrepreneur. Right. And that's, that's fine. We don't need a world full of entrepreneurs. But so it. getting back to the question, are, are, you, are you making the case, I would make the case, are you making the case that being an entrepreneur puts you in a position where it's easier to live by your moral code? Yeah, I think so. Because I don't have to, compromise my values in order to ensure the goodwill of my employer. That's not entirely true. That's why I kind of slowed down. Like when I first started out, let's say as a clinician, I had difficulty filling my practice. And it was in those moments when my clients were more, were basically my employers and it became harder in in the beginning to to implement the kind of boundaries with respect to my practice that I wanted to implement because I didn't have a full practice let alone a wait list so if one person decided that you know this time didn't work for him or this is the how he would prefer therapy to go like I would have felt that loss like I might have needed that client more than that client needed therapy and that's not a good position for that client to be in like that's the actually kind of a dangerous position for that client to be in yeah. so one way to be kind of honest and virtuous is to not need any particular opportunity in 
in its specifics. So what would you say to a young guy? Let's, let's say that the guy who wrote this is 23 years old and he's wrestling with um, you know, how to create a moral code and enforce it. And he's one of these 23 year olds we were talking about earlier where he doesn't have his, his act together yet. Well, I, I think from my own experience, it, it just means being willing to pay the price for what you believe in. And sometimes to play kind of the other side of the coin here, doing so also lets you learn to pick your battles. I think when I was younger, I was even more punctilious with respect to my value system. What does that mean? Like, you know, exacting, okay. or if not even self-righteous okay. about certain things. And that often made it difficult to be in relationship with me, both men and women. I thought that it was my, my you know, high moral code and my standards for myself and others. Other people just probably found me to be difficult to deal with. And like, there's a time to stand firm, but that might mean losing access to certain types of relationships and opportunities. And you then have to kind of weigh in your estimation, like, what is this worth? Like, could I, is this really worth ending the relationship? Sometimes it is. If, if going back on that specific or compromising that specific value on some level significantly compromises the relationship, you're going to lose the relationship one way or the other. But some of those values were really just my own, I don't know, self-righteousness or intolerance, to be honest. And I could certainly have learned to navigate those relationships more flexibly. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense because I, you know, I, I had some similar experiences. And I think maybe one of the takeaways here is that when you're a younger guy, it sometimes is a little confusing the, to, to know where you're being moral versus just being pigheaded or self-righteous. And maybe that's where moral, you know, moral structure comes in, like religion. Maybe that, that helps with this sort of thing. But, um, you know, I think if you're a young guy, you give yourself a little grace to learn and adjust and figure out that, okay, that, that wasn't my morality operating. That was more my ego operating. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to adjust mm -hmm. next time. And, and I've learned a little something about my morals from this incident. I like that. All right. Well, we got time, I think, for one more question. What do I have here? This one also, you're in a better position to answer than I. Is it really possible to retain or even increase high erotic sexual desire when one is married slash together for years and decades? And if it is, how does one achieve that? What do you think, Sean? Yeah, it's possible. Absolutely, it's possible. I don't know if it's the norm, honestly. Um, and I don't know if it's not the norm, but it certainly is possible to keep the sex life going throughout your marriage. And it, it takes a little bit of effort, but, um, you know, there's, there's some data out there that says married men have more sex than, than single men, more and better sex. There's, there's data that says that there's probably data that says the other way too, but, um, it, it certainly is possible. And I think it takes a certain amount of. <laughs> It takes a certain amount of effort to stay involved and, and to make that a priority. I'm starting, this is all starting to sound like, you know, <laughs> something that any um, Instagram psychologist would say. It, it does take some little bit of effort to, to keep it going. And what does that effort look like? Can you give any actionable advice? Playfulness. Um, yeah, it's, if I had to boil it down to a word, it would just be playfulness. You, you keep flirting with your wife, keep flirting with your woman. And, um, you know, game, game doesn't go away. Game is forever and game should be fun. Game, should, in my estimation, game shouldn't be manipulative or, or, um, yeah, it shouldn't be manipulative. It should be a fun thing. Um, back when, you know, when I was a kid, Prince was the, the musician Prince was really big and you could, you could watch Prince as if you watch his, his movie, Purple Rain or, if, and I saw him in, um, in concert a couple of times and Prince was really good at just playing with an entire arena of people and flirting with an entire arena of people. And it was kind of, a, it was kind of 
interesting to watch how this this tiny little guy would hold an arena in in the palm of his hand by um, giving a little bit and then pulling it back and then joking and then and then making fun of you and then you know, just doing all these little playful things that that you might do in a relationship and that might have been part of why he was so successful but if you let those things die away and I, I guess I would say the other thing is probably taking care of yourself you know my wife and I had we made an agreement when we got together that we were going to take care of ourselves and it wasn't an ultimatum it wasn't hey if you get fat I'm leaving it was each of us volunteering that you know, I know I'm going to get older but I'm going to do my best to to stay presentable and to stay as attractive as possible for you and if I don't I'm going to understand if you want to renegotiate because part of this is about sex mhm I don't know if everybody's up for that kind of agreement. Hmm. It might be in the best interest of both of you, though, to kind of create some sort of accountability structure. Like, yeah, it might mean that I can't ever relax completely into a totally secure arrangement, mm -hmm. but maybe that lack of complete security is not just good for you, because it motivates me to be more presentable and attractive to you, but it's good for me because it motivates. I also accrue benefits from that by being healthier and by mm -hmm. being more vital and energetic. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think any kind of agreement that can't ever be rescinded is prone to more abuses than one that can. Um, and I think that there are ways that you can create those accountabilities into a committed relationship and that too much sec like permanent security may not be in the interests of the relationship or the individuals involved. I'm with you. I heard a rabbi say one time that the specter, the possibility that's different, the possibility of divorce is actually a very good and healthy thing for a marriage and that where there is no possibility of divorce like we see in certain cultures that's when marriages get really miserable that's when people can be abusive with abandon no fear of consequences men in particular and you know men in certain cultures if they know that their wife can't leave they they tend to get kind of abusive and and you know just turn nasty not all of them but when there's a possibility of divorce on both sides, then there's this, this incentive to you know, take care of yourself, take care of them, treat them well, and, and be a good partner. And I think it affects effort, and I think it affects effort beneath the threshold of conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. Like there is no way that anybody is going to put in more effort at a job if he feels that he could never be fired that had a job in which he has to be accountable for his employment. Like the man might be the most disciplined, virtuous person in the world, but that structure will insidiously affect his effort in ways that he's probably not even consciously aware of. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You might see that, for example, in places like the federal government where jobs are pretty cushy and secure. Folks tend to take it easy. You might see that if one were inclined to look in that direction. Yeah. Well, Sean, I think that is good for now. That was about 90 minutes. I enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'll plug your book. It's called Gatekeeper, The Tactical Guide to Commitment. It's Sean T. Smith's sixth foray into the literary sphere. I've read it. I really like it. I think it's a... I think it's a, a, a successor to the Tactical Guide to Women in, uh, in many ways. And that book is just phenomenal as well. So I'll put a link to the book in the description to this video. Um, and hopefully, if this has piqued your interest, you can go check out the book for yourselves. Any final words, Sean? Well, this is fun. I really enjoy the Q&A because it's like taking your brain to the gym to, to try to think on your feet. So this was a good time. I really appreciate you having me on again. And, oh, yeah. And once yeah, again, I'm congratulations sure we'll on all the progress with the channel. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thank you for being here. Always good to catch up. We'll talk again soon, okay? Yep. Bye-bye.